Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. It's good to love you. It is so wonderful to know how much you love us. We are very grateful for this. Thank you, O oh God Almighty, for this fellowship this morning. Thank you for what you prepared to do in our hearts, what you've started already. Please just glorify yourself and let our joy be full. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, please. Um, I asked if they had an acoustic guitar, but there used to be one in those days. Especially privileged to be here again, especially when it's not as cold as it used to be. <laughs> but in the the land of granite and the land of cold, it was only when I went to Norway that I saw a place that could be a bit colder. It was minus thirty-seven. So they had to cover my ears. They said my ears could disappear. <laughs> and then um, my wife and myself have a visa to visit Mongolia next month. And they told us that we're lucky that um, it won't be as cold as it was two months ago. It was as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius. Even with how it is now, I'm not sure I will be able to <laughs> to go. But uh, since God is our helper, he will help us and uh, see what comes out of it. I want to share a heart-to-heart -heart talk with us. Something I was telling my wife that anyone amongst us, and I mean anyone, anyone, amongst us, and I mean anyone, including myself, anyone amongst us who would embrace today's message, uh, will experience a shift in the spirit realm Amen. and enter a new level of service with God. Because it has to do with being powered by grace, powered by grace. Another way you can look at it is um, activating your ultimate potential. But I prefer that of powered by grace. Activating your ultimate potential is motivational. Powered by grace is revivalistic. And I, they are almost the same thing, but they are two different messages. If you ask me to speak on activating your ultimate potential, is slightly different from powered by grace. And I've distinguished the, between the two already. That one is motivational. It stirs you up, makes you ready, ready to work, ready to move, ready to get the best that God has for you. The other one is similar also, but that one brings you to a place of surrender. It makes you achieve more by doing less. It makes you aim at faith rather than facts. Because faith supersedes facts when it is revealed to you. If it is not, you will still base everything on facts, facts, facts. For instance, words are more powerful than works. Because words are creative and works uh, works have a way of rearranging things. And I can prove it from the scriptures. 
Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. Hebrews 11, 3. That says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the work of God, by the word of God. So after the worlds have been framed and been organized and everything architectured by the word, then we can now come in after the word has created it, then we will now begin to work to maintain it. God created Eden and then put Adam there. And Adam now started to work. But sometimes we, because we are human beings, we want to see things from our own perspectives. And that's why some people have looked for a way of trying their best to make sure they turn God to man. So that we measure God's opinions and God's standards according to that of man. Man first, then God later. If God cannot be man, we don't want him. And what is called is humanism. Man is king, not God. Let God come and worship man. That's what they are saying in essence. <laughs> but we thank God we belong to a different school of thought where we know that God is God and man is man. And that that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is limited. That which is born of the spirit is unlimited. There's no limit to it at all. I was talking with some young people and I don't know why, just like on this trip, very many of the young people we met are confused with this Big Bang theory. They're confusing the young people. <laughs> and I told them how I asked two questions in class when I was an undergraduate. The professor, a professor, biochemistry professor, had the same ideas. Talked about the big, the big bang. That was how he called it. The big bang. It is not like this. <laughs> By the time he talked and talked, and now uh, there were cells, uh, hydrogen and carbon or whatever combined, then uh, one cell, then multiple cells, and then finally to his grandfather, who is chimpanzee or ape. Because my grandfather is a real human being. <laughs> that, that professor's grandfather was, an, was a chimpanzee. So the chimpanzee gave birth to his great-grandfather and to his father. Finally, he arrived also. So I now asked a question. Was there some? I have two questions and two problems about this big bang. Where did the bang come from? If you say the bank banked and there was hydrogen, where did the hydrogen come from? Where did the carbon come from? There's no assurance of origin. And all you said was, I suppose, I suppose, let's suppose, let's suppose. You kept supposing and then you now came to a point when your grandfather became chimpanzee, you stopped supposing. But that chimpanzee or ape came out of supposition. That means if the foundation be wrong, then uh, the whole thing is a mess. I said, but, sir, <laughs> what I understand is that in the beginning, God created. And then the question is, who created God? If anybody could create God, then that God is not God. The ultimate, when you look backwards to where you can no longer go, God is there. In the beginning, the alpha, the omega, the beginning, the ending, the first, the last, 
everlasting to everlasting. In case we have uh, some young people that they are confusing like that, maybe you should ask your professor the question that I asked. Then the man later said, hey, you look like some of these, uh, do they call them scripture union or Christian union? Then the students are there laughing. <laughs> they say, yes, sir, he's one of their leaders. <laughs> I don't know why I branched to that. But because of the burden that is in my heart, it's possible there's someone that is having that challenge now that God is uh, delivering from that kind of error. It doesn't make sense now. You, you want to put your heart in what started from supposition. We are putting our hearts in, in fact, the second question I asked him, I said, Prof, sir, I can't understand how order and beauty could result from an accident. The Big Bang was an accident. I know what accident cars look like. There was an accident. And out of the accident, the beautiful Earth came out. Beautiful Saturn. All the beautiful planets came out. Out of the accident, the Earth started revolving, revolving in a definite way. The Earth revolves goes like this on its own and if this is the sun uh, it's going like this so it's going on its own it's going round it's going round and the sun itself is is turning everything is turning and you say it's an accident i said sir i don't think i look like an accident if i were an accident my teeth would be under my feet please look around is there someone who looks like an accident here Let's take him to the panel beaters. <laughs> Does anyone here look like an accident? David said, I am how? Beautifully, wonderfully made. Yeah, big, big bang. I don't know. My real problem is that the church does not realize that we are the most potent force on earth. Do you want me to prove that way again? I didn't come here for apologetics. <laughs> apologetics is uh, how you make the gospel intellectual. But if that's how God wants to make it run today, until finally I will say what I came here to say. <laughs> Then we'll let it run like that. Because our children are very important to me. Almost every home, one child is doubting, wondering, what are you doubting? What are you wondering? I told the parents, leave, just don't struggle with them. The Bible says, bring up a child in the way he, he should go. And when he's grown up, he will not depart from it. I said, let them go and compare your life with the life of that big bang man. Unless we have been living hypocritically. If you've been living the Christian life, by the time your children leave you and compare your life with all the rubbish outside there, they will say, no, reality is what I have tasted. It's because they tasted it so freely. They didn't have to do trial and error like some of us. We were born into it. And I say, well, daddy, well, I don't know whether I believe in God again. Uh, you won't be the first to go to hell. Let me tell you. And you will not be the last. Go to hell if you want to go. Go. It's up. The Bible says hell enlarges itself. There's enough room for you if that's where you like. Somebody told me that Shebi Fela will be there. That all the rock stars will be there. Say, man, hell's going to be hot, man. <laughs> I said, yeah, it's going to be hot. Hotter than you think. It will be so hot, according to the Bible, that the worms will not die. There will be worms there. 
And if what I saw in Isaiah, I think 66 is right, it means that the mattress will be warm and the blanket will be warm. So in case the person is in hell and out of the pain wants to say, oh, as he opens his mouth, what will fill his mouth? Worms. If you like it, I mean, you know what I prefer? I don't like those. I'm a bit, I'm a bit in the Lord and a bit in the world. <laughs> Choose one. Choose one. Why are you a hypocrite? After all, everybody told you not to lie. Choose one. If you like hell, eh? Tell them I want hell. How can I call it to sound more hellish? If you want God, follow God. One day, one young man asked me, he said, what? tell me one word. If you are to explain what has happened in your life as a Christian, I, <laughs> I preached my first sermon just a few years ago. In February 1971. So, the young man was asking, tell me one word, one word. I said, if I should mention one word, it's help. That God helped me. All through my life. I was dreaming of playing cricket this morning. (laughs) When I dozed off, it was my favorite game. The best catch that I made at the slips is not a catch I could take under normal circumstances. I was helped by God. The best shot that I ever took as a batsman, I took it against Nigeria number one bowler. And everyone acknowledged that that I wouldn't take that shot on a normal day. I was helped. I told him, helped. That's one word. And when I looked at the Bible, it was as if it resembled what Paul was talking about. He said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Grace. Grace is another way of saying help. You know, they try to save me the problem of climbing here. It's not as I cannot climb it. But since I turned 70, nowadays when I'm climbing, I have to add my hand to my knee for some small support. And then I don't know how many floors we had to climb. You know, where I was staying. But there was something that we entered when we entered it, they said, doors, doors, doors opening, doors closing. Mind the doors. <laughs> and then the thing closed. And then did started going up, going up, going up. Took us to several floors. The highest I ever went was, uh, was it 85 floors in Dubai with my wife. And that one was so fast. We just entered like this. It just started. Suppose I was climbing this thing. I will finish you. <laughs> I can walk from here back to Nigeria. It depends on how long. <laughs> Can't I walk from here to Nigeria? And I walk small. I sleep at the nearest uh, place now. I... But that lift made all the difference. I was asking them, how do we come to Aberdeen from London? They said, well, two easiest ways. One of them will take you about six hours. I said, rule that one out. He said, by rail. I said, go and sit down and see if I'm going back to Nigeria by air. No, they said, you can relax, sleep through the night. I said, no, which was the second one? One hour, 40 minutes. As help. That's how grace operates. And that's why I'm saying powered by grace means 
you do less to achieve more. I have taken quite some time um, reading about people that God used in revivals. Usually God brought them to the point where they did less to achieve more. And there are seven principles in that that I would like to share with us on how this grace works. First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15 verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet, not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Doing less, achieving more. Doing less, achieving more. <laughs> I heard of someone who was carrying a very big box and then now someone decided to give her a lift in a lorry. So when she got in, she said, this lorry, you have tried carrying me. So let me help you carry the luggage on my head. And she kept the luggage on her head. So they had to tell her whether you are carrying it or whether you drop it, it's the same lorry carrying it. She now finally agreed and dropped it. Many of us cannot embrace grace because we, we, want, we want, want to arrogate to ourselves the fact that, look, when, when I arrived, you know, things changed, man. <laughs> Until I arrived. <laughs> when I got there, man, things began to happen. Yeah, I did it, man. I did it. I'm King Kong. <laughs> I did it, man. I did it. <laughs> but when you make up your mind that you will depend on God, then you will see the extra perspectives to your life. There's a supernatural dimension to your life. There's a supernatural dimension to your academics, supernatural dimension to your job. That's our brother with the short, long testimony. You know, you saw the supernatural dimensions to his job. Was it not a short, long testimony? <laughs> <laughs> he had jobs in threes after 200. The supernatural dimension. God is the one who opens doors. And when he shuts, no one can open it. But when God opens that door, no man can shut it. I am pleading with us that today that we learn to depend on God so that you will do less and achieve more. That's the key to the spiritual life. I handed over our ministry, the ministry I started by God's grace, to another general overseer 12 years ago. And in the 12 years that I handed over to him, by God's grace, I've accomplished more, in my own opinion. I don't know how many times more than the 20 years that I was general overseer whether it's in terms of number of songs or number of books or number of places that God has taken me to or number of souls that have made decisions for Christ. Because I've just learned to do less and achieve more by faith, faith that activates grace. Because you people are very, very intelligent and very intellectual, I want to look at those seven, seven principles. But before I go to those seven principles, 
the picture that is in my mind is like this. Uh, somebody told me a story of somebody who was playing the keyboard. And as he was playing the keyboard, that someone else came in and listened to him. And they said, can I play a bit? He said, okay. And the man played. Ah. And the keyboardist who owned the thing was just listening wrapped in attention and was wondering where is this man from? He's playing my heart. He's playing everything I ever thought of playing. Oh, he's so good. And he was just watching, watching. And later the man said, well, I, I'm done. I've got to go now. I said, please, who are you? Who are you? And the man said, I am the person you are supposed to become. And disappeared. So what I'm saying is, that God will help you this morning to see what he created you to become. And then you will know that the bridge between where you are now and where you should be is called grace. It's grace. You can make it by your effort. It's like my going back to Nigeria, trekking from here. You can make it. <laughs> but grace is like entering British airline that I, is it Airways or airline, whichever one, air is in it. <laughs> British air, <laughs> let me stop there. So conclude the, <laughs> enter in six hours between Heathrow and Lagos, you are there. In fact, they even removed 10 minutes for us. Our own was a bit faster when it was coming. Five hours, uh, 50 minutes. Unlike if you were trekking. If you depend on grace, you will become what God wants you to be. But the first thing is that word, but. Paul says, but. Why but? But means it's a turn around. If I was facing this direction, they just turned around. A number of times we have a mentality that does not want change. But someone said that the only permanent thing in life is change. <laughs> The only permanent thing, every other thing keeps changing. Only change never changes because it's always changing. We know that it's, it just keeps changing. It's the only permanent thing. But Paul could have thought about it. I persecuted the church. God will never forgive me. I've met a number of people who came to me during counseling sessions and said, look, Said, What's your problem? The sin I committed in 1974. Eh? Have you confessed it? Oh, more than 1,000 times. Eh? Said, what God wanted to hear was just once. Just to confess it once. And I will tell them, your problem is not that God has not forgiven you. It is that you have not forgiven yourself. Ah! Someone said it there. I think I should hand this mic. <laughs> you have not forgiven yourself. You're not forgiving yourself. Paul could have said, I persecuted the church. No, I cannot be an apostle. And you know, even though God is sovereign, in his sovereignty, he allows us choice, the power of choice. We can choose not to be. We can choose to remain laid back spiritually. When it comes to your job, you're active, you're proactive. You're a man of action. When it comes to spiritual things, you're laid back. Uh, I'm still looking at the possibility of considering how to begin to think about the avenues of finding out whether there are ramified dimensions uh, to begin to study my Bible every day. May God have mercy on us in the name of Jesus Christ. And I put that name because I meant that prayer that I prayed. That God would have mercy on us. For a number of us, there is that spiritual reluctance. And what is the reluctance all about? We are not ready to surrender everything. 
If you surrender everything, God will use you. God will use you. God will use you. If I does the call for today, how many people are ready to say, look, the past is the past. God, take everything. Look, that song, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Every moment of my life, take it. Lord, take it. Lord, take it. And what I learned about surrender over the years is that if you are not completely surrendered to God, you will know it. You can't mechanize it. You cannot tell yourself, I have surrendered completely to God. I have, I have. When you have not. As you're saying, I have surrendered completely to God. Though, something in your heart will be telling you, no, you have not. <laughs> There's something still remaining. There are some areas still remaining. Today, may God help us to surrender completely. Yes. Can you imagine someone enters the airplane and is supposed to go to Nigeria? He says, no, I don't want. Get me, get me a rope. Tie my waist and tie me to the tail of the plane. I don't want to stay inside. I want to stay outside. I want to stay outside. And then they carry him. In fact, he would, he would die not even out of the speed, out of the cold. Because there is about minus, uh, sometimes minus 50 Celsius. But we come in, they say, fasten your seat belts. And we fasted our seat belts. Because right there, we make up our minds to surrender to whatever we are asked to do. So that we can enjoy the fullness of the grace of that speed of getting to Lagos in six hours instead of trekking. May the Lord help us to embrace grace in the name of Jesus Christ. And then the first thing that grace aims at doing is to change your life. Some of us want grace to change our circumstances without changing our lives. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Before he says, I labored. God wants to change your life. One of my favorite motivational speakers is Jim Ron. Jim Ron, Ron like John, but R instead of J. Jim Ron. He keeps telling you that the most important thing about your life is the value you have added to your own life. He says, if you work hard at your career, you will increase your earning and better your living. But if you work hard on yourself, that you will increase your profit. And when he's talking about increasing your profit, He's talking about making much more money than just the salary. The person who works on himself positions himself for a much greater thing, both with God and man. Someone did the analysis that if everybody is paid by hour, that there are some people who are paid five pounds per hour. And there are some people who are paid 500,000 pounds per hour. What's the difference? It's, it's, it's the value they place on the person. The value they place on you. And they place values on you according to who you are. So allow God to use grace to work on you. But there's one caution I want to point out before we pray. There's something going on in my country, Nigeria, amongst young people. We call it hyper grace. You see, many times, when the devil sees that we are catching a revelation of something, he wants to turn that thing in a way that that thing becomes evil. 
Hyper grace is when people begin to idolize grace. Grace is not an end in itself. It's a means. God is the end. Okay, suppose I enter that place. I enter the lift. And then the lift reached the end. I remain there. I'm not going anywhere. I say, ah, Pastor Charles, come out now. I say, no. Ah, let me speak my Yoruba language. Me love you, God. Me love you, God. Every minute. Then I press it. The thing will go down. <laughs> The door will open. Doors opening. I say, opening for yourself. <laughs> Doors closing. Correct. Then I press. It goes up again. And I just remain there all my life. My wife will remember to bring me food. Even if all of you forsake me. <laughs> food time. Doors opening. Darling, your food. Thank you. My job becomes lift job. Staying on the lift. Please, which kind of hospital would you want to take me to? <laughs> which one? <laughs> Psychiatry. Some people have idolized grace. Say, look, man, I want to tell you something. It doesn't matter how you live. You only believe, man. Look, God has done it all for you. He's forgiven the sins of the past and the sins of the present and the sins of the future and the sins that are eternal. All your sins from everlasting to everlasting, God has forgiven. So you ain't got no sin, man. <laughs> Glory. Come on, preach it, preacher. Preach it. Preach it. You ain't got no sin, man. Because your sin from everlasting to everlasting he has removed. <laughs> One pastor was trying to seduce a young girl. And the girl was saying, but sir, you, <laughs> you are a pastor. He said, that, you know, it has not been revealed to you the higher level of grace. <laughs> higher level of grace. There's a level of grace you enter into. Uh, any sin you commit is forgiven before you commit it. <laughs> Hyper grace. So what I told some of those people, I said, look, <laughs> the word of God is real. There are people who will prophesy in the name of the Lord. There are people who walk miracles in his name. And on that day, he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Why? You workers of iniquity. If you have grace, grace will have strength enough to change your life. If you say you have grace and you're living the way you were living before you found that grace, you did not find grace. Maybe you found grass. There was a time when I was a traveling secretary. I was working amongst students in the tertiary institutions in Nigeria. And they were preaching one doctrine. They said, you know, I am a spirit. I said, yeah, that's correct. I have a soul. Of course. I live in a body. Correct. But I'm a spirit. Of course you're a spirit. So, any sin committed by my body is not me committing it. Because I'm a spirit. I had to call for a meeting. Gathered them together. And I said, I know some of you have been having problems with your bodies. And um, the Lord just laid it on my heart to help you. With the authority that God has given me, I want to separate your body from your spirit. <laughs> you know, I have a way of, I'll be making people, they'll be laughing, but they are hearing what I'm telling them. <laughs> I want to, why should your body be disturbing you? 
I want to separate your body from your spirit. From today, only your spirit will be moving <laughs> up and down. <laughs> Then I made the altar call. All those who want their bodies separated from their spirit, come out. Not one. Why? Why do you think they didn't come out? Because once you separate the spirit and the body, the person is dead. So it says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. If grace can change your life, then grace will easily change your situation by your life. Let's rise up and pray. Let's talk to God. He is our God. He is our King. He is our Redeemer. His call to us today is for Absolute surrender. Absolute surrender to God that allows grace to function in our lives. And I'm not going to ask anybody to come forward because I'm very serious about this matter and I want you to take this decision between you and God right where you are. Absolute surrender to God. To tell you the truth, the body in my heart is that there are people here that God wants to, let me put it this way, to adopt Scotland. The way John Knox said, give me Scotland or I die. That there are people who spiritually will say, Lord, Save Scotland or do whatever else you want to do with my life. I want you to think beyond Aberdeen. But of course, you have to make the impact right here. And the call is for absolute surrender. God may want you just to pray. God may want you to pay some money somewhere. And God may want you to go and do something. But absolute surrender, that's what God wants from you. Please talk to God. Talk to him. You see, in my heart, I see some people want to negotiate with God. I see some are saying, okay, God, I'll give you 60%. <laughs> Maybe you should take it higher. 70. Maybe you should still take it higher and say, Lord, 80% of all that I am and of all that I have. See, take it higher. Oh God, 90% of all that I am. And when you have 90% of all that I am, you have 90% of all that I have. I know God, 100%, everything. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, today. Take my moments and my go and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. When God has your moments, has your days, has your life, then the silver and the gold come. The other things just follow naturally. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Tell the Lord the percentage of your life that you surrender to him today. And I want you to mean it. I mean, you're talking to God, so don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. He knows whether what you're saying is true or not. So be truthful. Be truthful to God. And I told you that this thing is for every one of us. Because I want to pray for us at this moment.
Oh God, maker of heaven and earth. God, with whom nothing is impossible. All things are possible with you, oh God. Without exception, all things are possible with you. Oh Father, have mercy upon us. Help our infirmities. Lord, listen to our cries. Because some of us, Lord, our heart cry is 100%. 100%. I know that as some of us are crying in our hearts, there's a dichotomy between our hearts and our heads. Our heads are bargaining for less. Creating room for anxiety. Creating room for fear. That we take authority in the name of Jesus. We banish every anxiety. We banish every fear. We receive faith in the name of Jesus. For the just shall live by faith. 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 Father, by faith, we compel our minds to submit to our hearts. Submit to our spirits. We yield everything to you. A hundred percent, oh God. You know our heart cry. You know our heart cry. You know our heart cry. Lord, we yield a hundred percent of all that we are to you in the name of Jesus. Oh God, let grace be activated in our lives from today. Let grace be activated in our lives from today. So that grace will strengthen us to labor and labor more than any other person. And yet, grace. Father, we thank you. I want you, where you are, to just thank God for accepting your service. Just thank him for accepting your surrender. 